the past 3,400 years, humans have been entirely at peace for only 268 of them, or just 8% of recorded history. Wars between ideologies, religion, government, and countries have been fought by men and women who believed their cause worth dying for. But strife does not limit itself to the battlefield. It appears on a smaller scale in our everyday lives as clashes with family, neighbors, or even strangers. Is humanity simply predisposed to war and conflict? What if at the root of all this hostility is a clash so great, so diabolical, that the wildest imagination cannot comprehend its intensity? What if at the root is enmity? What many people fail to realize is there's a battle going on in this world, not between the nations and the governments, but between good and evil. Enmity, brewing in one person's heart, led to a cataclysmic war that has raged for thousands of years. The battlefield was heaven. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought, and his angels, and prevailed not. Here in heaven began the most hate-filled and devious war to have ever been fought. Two classes of angels. One siding with Michael, the other class siding with the dragon. Satan, who was Lucifer before he fell. Lucifer was the highest angel in heaven. He was, in a sense, commanding the heavenly host. He was the one who gathered them when it came to worshiping God. He led the choirs of heaven. Lucifer had stood at the head of the angelic host. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardius, topaz and diamond, beryl, onyx and jasper, sapphire, turquoise and emerald with gold. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. Lucifer had been a covering cherub. He had first-hand knowledge of the character of God. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery storms. He was right next to the throne of God, in the very presence of God. If there was any being who would have had a more perfect knowledge of who God was, it would have been Lucifer. He was, at that time, a friend of God, a servant of God. And among the created host, he was, he was the highest in glory and honor there in the courts of heaven. God put Lucifer in a position where Lucifer would have the most exposure to God's glory, where Lucifer would have the greatest insights into God's selflessness, where Lucifer would have every reason in the whole universe, more reason than anyone else, to love and trust God. Like every being that the Creator made, Lucifer was perfect until one day he corrupted himself. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created until iniquity was found in you. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. 
I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. He was perfect, but he had the capacity to choose. And if he had the capacity to choose, it means he could exercise that choice. And once he exercised that choice to rebel, that is when iniquity was found in him. Now, I want us to be clear that the Bible does not teach that God was responsible for sin in no way. Uh, the Bible is very clear that the entrance of sin came through the fact that it was found in Lucifer. Uh, Lucifer was created by God as a perfect being. Lucifer was not satisfied to be next to the throne. He wanted to sit on the throne. He wanted to be God. And so he rebelled against the government of God by instigating a revolt. Love is willing to take risks. You see, when God created his beings in the beginning, he gave them the power of choice. And when you do that, you run the risk that some of his creatures may choose to go contrary to his wishes. Lucifer's lust for absolute power demanded a cunning previously unseen in heaven. The government of heaven had been established forever. The authority and justice of God was unrivaled and undisputed. How could Lucifer sway the angels to have sympathy with him? Lucifer uh, tried to get them to disobey God. From his high position, he began to implant doubt into the minds of the heavenly citizens. What began as simple questions quickly escalated to propaganda. Skillfully, Lucifer brought in controversy against God's government, authority, and law. If this rebellion was against the authority of God, then that authority implies a system of legal governance. There must have been laws, regulations, which formed the foundation of the government of God. Lucifer's rebellion has always focused on attacking the law of God. God's government is one of order and harmony. Like any government, it has a law, a set of protective boundaries for both its citizens and the kingdom's welfare. It is the law that guarantees peace and happiness, and any departure from it endangers the harmony of the entire universe. Now, the law of God as we know it today had not yet been codified because that law pertains particularly to the human race. It talks about father and mother and relationship between man and man. But the principles of the law, this law of love to honor God above all things and to obey him and love him with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind, and the principles which then flow through to his created beings, they were part and parcel of the character of God, perhaps not codified in the present form, but present nevertheless. When Lucifer rebelled, he rebelled against this very law, calling it restrictive. Lucifer thought he was too exalted to be treated like a created being. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. 
wasn't he holy and wasn't he good in his being, good enough not to require regulations and rules which governed the government of God? The Bible says that Lucifer's lust for power and position, his pride over his own beauty, and his lies and accusations about God, all this was sin. Sin is the act of breaking God's eternal law. Sin is actually a war in war against the law of God, which is against God himself. And you know, when we sin against the law of God, when we sin against God, we break, we break God's heart. One effect of sin and of Lucifer becoming sinful has been a great misunderstanding regarding the character of God. For that reason, it's always been Satan's business to obscure the character of God, and that's the thing sin does. Sin creates misery, and then sin blames that misery on God. Had God eradicated Lucifer from the beginning and put an end to him, then this thought of a wrathful God who would intervene and destroy anyone who even thinks of dissent would have been placed into the minds of the remaining angels and God would ad infinitum have had a government of fear. So God did not do that. He allowed sin to develop to the point where every created being in the entire universe could make an informed decision as to the consequences of rebellion. The ideas had been disseminated across the entire spectrum of the angelic host. These questions of loyalty, of the goodness or the non-goodness of God were impressed upon every mind. Lucifer created a false picture of God portraying the Almighty as a dictator who imposed laws which were impossible to follow and were only for God's own benefit at the expense of greater freedoms. The only way Lucifer could convince the angels to follow him would have been to slander and vilify the character of God. He spoke to the angels. He was implicating that if he were in charge or if he were exalted to that high position, that there would be much more happiness and joy in heaven, that his only purpose in seeking that was to grant freedom to all the angels. Whereas he inferred that God's object was to control that or restrict that freedom that the angels then had. So how far did God need to go with this experience with sin? He gave Lucifer freedom, and of course, God would not have been honest with himself if he had said that he was giving freedom to the universe, but then had refused to create someone who did wrong. Uh, even if no one ever caught him, that wouldn't be honest. And if it's not honest, it's not harmless. So when God gave us freedom, he really gave us freedom. Let's assume that God could have skipped creating Lucifer. If God had failed to create Lucifer, does that mean there never would have been an angel that would have sinned? If God had destroyed Lucifer immediately, that would have showed that while he was interested in justice, that he did not have any foresight. It would have been shown that God's way of dealing with sin was not an effective way to prevent its regrowth. It would have reduced how angels related to him in terms of trust. Eventually, the angels marshaled into companies, some siding with Lucifer and some refusing to relinquish the thought of the goodness and fairness and justice of God. And they sided with the Son of God, 
the one who is what God is, Michael. Opposing Lucifer and leading the armies of God was the archangel Michael. Throughout the scriptures, he plays major and decisive roles. Have you ever wondered what was the name of Jesus in the Old Testament? You know, when he's born there in Matthew and his name is called Jesus, well, that's not when he came into existence. Jesus existed for forever before that time. But in the Old Testament, what's he called? The Old Testament name for Jesus is Michael. It doesn't mean that Jesus is one of those created beings, the angels. It doesn't mean that at all. Uh, Michael is the chief of the angels. He's the one that gives orders to the angels. He's the one that tells Gabriel what to do. And you can understand why, why Michael is called an archangel when you know that that word arch means leader. The only one higher than Lucifer would have been the Son of God himself, Jesus. Now, Michael was also the creator of all the angelic hosts, including Lucifer. The Son was God, just as the Father was God, from everlasting to everlasting. Michael, or Jesus, could enter into those purposes of God because he was one with the Father in nature, in character, and in purpose. Michael, the one who is what God is, was taken into the council of God. And the angelic host were excluded from this council. And this incited jealousy in Lucifer. And this jealousy started fermenting in his mind and he started communicating this jealousy to the angelic host. Why should he, the exalted covering cherub, not also be taken into the council of God? Lucifer did not f feel it was fair <clears throat> that the Son of God could, would receive this high position. Uh, Lucifer felt that he should have that honor as well. The Council of God met right before heaven's civil war broke out. But it was not to counter Lucifer's plotting. It had a very different agenda. The Bible tells us what was decided during that meeting. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Why did God decide at this critical moment when all of these rebellious ideas were circulating in heaven to create man? When in fact, this creation of man brought the rebellion to a head and there was war in heaven. Is man just an afterthought? Is man just a continuum of the creative process? Or did God have a purpose with the creation of man? Day by day, God spoke the world into existence meticulously creating every element. He gave purpose to everything that came into being. From the lights that illuminate the sky, to the sea, the earth, the vegetation, and all life on the planet in its abundance and variety. Everything bore the stamp of the Creator's handiwork and character, including the first man and the first woman, Adam and Eve.
God came to the end of his perfect work, there was only one way he could describe his creation. And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. There was no trace of decay, no trace of chaos or disorder in this new earth. In nature, God intended that we would see plenty of evidence that some super intelligent and powerful being had been involved in the creation of this world. You can see in nature plenty of evidence of God's love. The fact that I can taste a ripe peach or ripe blueberries, uh, the fact that God made the world to be full of not only beauty but of sounds that delight the ear, the waterfall and the bird, we find everywhere evidence that Earth wasn't just created so we could survive, it was created so we would be happy. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion of the fish of the sea, and of the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. When God created Adam and Eve in the beginning and put them in the garden, the Bible tells us that he gave them dominion over the earth. They were in control. They were, they were in control of this earth under the authority of God, mind you. He created him male and female. He shared with them the capacity to bring forth life. In a sense, he is sharing his creative capacity with this new creation. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the seas. None of the angels had dominion. They were beings that were subordinate to God, and God is the one who had the dominion, not the angels. So here was a new order of being, sharing in the creative capacity, having dominion. All the heavenly hosts were in awe of God's creative power and of creation itself. Here they could see a new race that bore the image of the Creator. But there was one in the universe who was not as enthusiastic. In fact, the very presence of these new beings was for him but a reminder that there was a higher authority above him. All he saw in these beings is the one he had grown to hate. And Lucifer was enraged because he did not see why God should have all the power and the reins in his hand when he was such an exalted being. Couldn't he share that with him? And now he was sharing it with man. For what purpose? God was going to create an order of being that should understand the mind of God as a creator and a caretaker. Because creating means taking responsibility. Bringing forth children means taking responsibility. Watch care, hedging in, nurturing, protecting. Now God didn't create man to fall, but he created him with the capacity of choice, which means he had the capacity to fall, just as Lucifer fell. So here was an order of being that was to embody something which would eventually prove that God was all wise in his creation. Heaven has invested a lot in us because we, he, God wants us to demonstrate to the universe his whole purpose in saving uh, the, the human race and, and, and protecting the unfallen worlds from making the same mistake that this world has made. The Bible doesn't give us the exact order in which the events took place, but it was around the time of the creation of this world that the war in heaven escalated to a crisis point. 
and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not neither was their place found any more in heaven and the great dragon was cast out that old serpent called the devil and Satan which deceiveth the whole world he was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him Lucifer lost the battle in heaven as well as his position as covering cherub he became known as Satan which means the one who opposes he was thrown out of heaven forever banished but unwilling to give up he would carry the war against God's government anywhere he could and so he turned his attention to the people he hated most in a world where he could see God everywhere he looked earth when God created Adam and Eve, Satan must have accused him, and you've probably hedged them in by your protection. How will they be able to make an informed choice if they don't have the other side of the story? So God permitted a test. Just as parents do all they can to warn their children of dangers, God did all he could to keep Adam and Eve from choosing poorly. In the garden, Satan was not permitted to roam freely to harass Adam and Eve. He was only given permission to be in one tree. And by Eve's own confession, they were told not to even touch it, lest they die. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Of all the things God gave to mankind, one is most precious, and that is the gift of choice. Everyone on earth has freedom to choose, and we are free to exercise that choice without any interference from God. He neither prevents nor forces any of our choices. So why did God not create his beings without the capacity to choose? Well, then you would have robotic beings without the capacity to choose love has no basis whatsoever imagine i married my wife and she was programmed to love me and never to rebel or question any of my commands what value would there be in that love if every morning she got up and she said, I love you, and I say, I need this and this and this done, and she proceeds to do it without question, that might be great for about 10 years, 15 years, and after that, it would become a mere ritual. And if every morning she said the same things, eventually I would say, just keep quiet, because what value is there in that love? But if she has a choice and in spite of my idiosyncrasies still loves me after 10, 15, 20, 30 or more years, that love has value. Choice is the absolute essential foundation for relationship. So God permitted choice, but then he had to also be prepared to bear the consequences of that choice. You know, when you're afraid of your father, you can't really have that love and trust that makes it pleasant to be at home. And God could have had an experience with his creatures like that if he would, but he wanted to have us love and trust him. Our choices shape who we are. Every decision, however small, contributes to our moral development or the formation of what is known as our character. And our characters determine the fabric of our society. 
The only way for injustice and cruelty to be eradicated from this planet is for society to be made up of people with upright moral characters. People who choose not to hurt others. So giving us freedom, giving us a chance to love and trust was an opportunity for us to develop character. In fact, you could say that moral character is love and trust. That a growth in morality is a growth in love and trust. And where you have fear as a guiding principle or where you don't have choice, love and trust cannot grow. When you have love and trust, you can have long-term happiness and obedience. But when you have fear as a motivational principle, you have short-term obedience and long-term misery. So what God is looking for is that long-term picture, and that's why he gave us that precious gift of choice. Here, in the beautiful, perfect Garden of Eden, God placed two trees. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. And they were allowed to partake freely of the tree of life. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they were told not to eat. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayst freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Why was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil even in the garden? The trees were symbolic. You can create a beautiful face. You can create a beautiful body. You can create a wise mind. But you can't create a beautiful moral character. Character is a product of choosing. And where there is no choosing, there is no character. Every time Eve or Adam would choose not to eat, that would be a development that would make them more like God, more capable of love, more capable of trust. God never intended anyone to understand evil. God never intended any mother to sit and cry at the grave of a lost son or daughter. God never intended tears of pain, the consequences of sin. When God wanted to develop morality in Adam and Eve, he gave them a task that in many ways was easy. Think about that tree, that one tree. I mean, they had thousands of trees like we do here that were good for food and just one that they couldn't eat. But when we say that that was an easy test that he gave them, we don't mean that it lacked uh, complexity. That is, Satan had an intention to deceive them, and Satan had permission to be there at that tree. So the test was in some ways very simple, but in other ways it was a test of the very things God wanted to develop, love and trust. And if they would love him and trust him, they would not be vulnerable to that tree, to that deceiver at the tree. But as soon as love and trust would falter, that would make vulnerability that would turn that easy test into a difficult test. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The image of God in man was in line with the principles of God's character and law. But Satan wanted to destroy that image of God in us. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. By attacking the law of God, 
Satan destroys the most accurate instrument for man to know who God is and what he stands for. And in turn, we lose sight of who we were designed to be like. Because the law of God is an expression of God's character, uh, this is a reason that Satan wants to destroy the law of God, to tear it down, to make it seem as though it's of no effect for us in our lives today. He wants us to go about thinking this, this novice, you know, illogical idea that living outside of God's law gives us freedom and, and gives us what we want. Some people think they're restrained or confined by the law of God. That somehow God made these laws just so he could be worshiped, just so he could control us. This, this is the same argument that Satan would have used against the angels in, in heaven when he said that his way would give you freedom. He wants to bring in the idea that God doesn't have the right to restrict us in this way or in that way. And so we have the concept that the commandments are restrictive barriers rather than a hedge to protect us from calamity. I don't know about you, but in my book, freedom to be filled with pain and sorrow and, and death is not a freedom I want. Uh, I, I would love a freedom that gives me life and hope and health and longevity and, and joy and, and those things. To know what is going to harm someone else sometimes requires insights that are more than human. And that's why there's a law in this universe. The law gives us insight into what really does cause harm. Oftentimes people feel that freedom is the ability to do what I want. And as long as I have the ability to choose to do whatever I want, then I'm free. One person's freedom to do as he or she chooses is what can end up causing pain and suffering to others. Killing, adultery, Theft are all clear examples of how one person's supposed freedom to do what they want ends up hurting someone else. And Adam and Eve's choice to eat the fruit is how death, pain, and suffering came to all of us in this world. Truly, the, a lot of the things we choose to do when we choose to live the way I want and that are sinful are really a bondage to us. Satan wants us to believe that God is a tyrant. All of our false doctrines about God come from this idea that God is a tyrant. And they all, they all circle around the character of God. And so the devil, at, at, his, at his basest level, when he's deceiving us, is trying to deceive us about the character of God. And Satan, or Lucifer, used the snake as the first transcendental medium to instill a question in the mind of Eve. Did God really say? He doesn't come out straight with his argument. He comes via the back door. He first questions God's word and questions God's authority and then starts to demonstrate that what God has said is not really so. Uh, the first time we see Satan in the Bible is described as very subtle. It was very sneaky, very, uh, very apt at deception. And he deceives Eve. Satan misrepresents God 
as one who is withholding from Adam and Eve something for their good or benefit. Satan placed suspicion in the mind of the woman about the righteous character of God. Eve believes the words that she's hearing and then she runs to Adam and she presents it to him. Lucifer used the same propaganda on Eve that he had used in heaven to turn God's loyal subjects against him. Doubting God's goodness, downplaying the need of Allah, and vilifying God's character. Eve entertained the false ideas of the serpent and placed herself under Satan's banner, thus becoming his agent in deceiving her husband, Adam. Adam knew that this was wrong. I mean, they had been commanded by God, and he sees this woman that God had created to be with him. This is his mate. This is his, you know, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. And, and here she had eaten of this fruit, and she's, now she's saying, taste it with me, taste it with me. And Adam had no opportunity to be deceived. He knew. Now, when Adam chose, I'm sure there were a lot of things going through his mind, but really it ended up being a lack of faith in the Word of God, in the power of God on Adam's part. It may not seem to us such a big deal that Adam and Eve would have eaten the fruit and gone against the commandment of God. What, what can little fruit do, right? Adam and Eve probably didn't realize the big deal either. In choosing to do that, they broke their allegiance with God. They had been giving themselves to God in, in allegiance. And now they had chosen a, a different master. They had given their allegiance to someone else who they had obeyed instead of God. Humanity fell in this one instance, not because of a fruit, but because of a choice, a decision that forever changed the course of history and of humanity itself. Just as with many generals, the outcome of a war often comes down to one battle. And for Adam and all mankind, this one was lost. One of the first effects of sin was that it put a separation between Adam and Eve and their creator. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. Sin separates us from God, and it does it in a way that you might say is self-preserving, because we're afraid to be exposed, we're afraid to be punished. What did Adam and Eve do? They hid themselves. That's what sin does. It leads us to escape judgment to try to avoid responsibility for our actions. Like the war in heaven, the war that Satan began here on earth was an attempt to overthrow God's government. When Adam and Eve fell, they handed their dominion over to Satan. He became known as the prince of this world, and he would reign as the cruelest despot this world has ever known. As descendants of Adam and Eve, we now live under the enemy government of Satan. Our earth was taken over by a foreign ruler, and we have been assimilated into this new administration. It is the only system we have ever known, and for this very reason, many people don't realize that they live in a hostile takeover situation, ruled by a sadistic ruler at war with God himself. Just like some earthly tyrants that have killed and terrorized their own people, Satan does the same. Satan has used every means possible to bring chaos, disorder, and blight to the human race. Working in the shadows, through the angels that fell with him from heaven, and any human agent that through their choices sides with him, he has thrown this once beautifully created world into anarchy, rebellion, and havoc. God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Just as Lucifer changed from the beautiful angel he once was to the demon Satan, mankind also changed, corrupting the goodness that God had endowed them with. 
The Bible tells us that before sin, man was made after God's image, but after sin, the image of God in man was marred. Man's nature went from being sinless to sinful, and men turned against each other and even against their maker. Violence, brutality, and immorality spread all over the earth. Satan rejoiced as his ranks grew with more and more wickedness. The beings to whom God had given creative capacity chose to serve Satan and to be imbued with his rebellious attitude, and their offspring would do the same. They were now infected with the disease of sin. They now had a natural inclination for evil. After Adam and Eve fell, God could not allow them to eat of the tree of life. It would have perpetuated sin forever, and Satan's government would have been established forever as well. Evil would have been immortalized, and suffering, pain, and war would continue unabated. When Adam and Eve sinned, they left the Garden of Eden, but it wasn't of their own choice. You remember that God expelled them from the Garden, and that showed several important ideas. For one thing, they no longer had access to that tree that gave them immortality, the tree of life. That was to show that God will not allow this experiment of sin to go on forever. It's going to come to an end. And it also showed that separation we talked about that sin puts an end to our person or face-to-face -face communication with God. It was a symbol, if you will, of spiritual death. And it showed something else. Satan had offered them a higher existence, a better life. He, in fact, offered Eve improvement and more knowledge. But was he able to deliver on what he offered? Quite in the contrary. When they were expelled from the garden, they lost what they already had. Don't think for a minute that sin only causes misery here on earth. It's miserable in heaven when they see humans that they love so much sinning. And it was miserable when there was even war in heaven. Sin causes misery wherever it has an influence. And if Adam and Eve had been permitted to have both immortality and sin at the same time, that would have been a miserable eternity I wouldn't want it, they wouldn't want it. Humanity, in its current fallen condition, would only be self-seeking, looking for indulgence, lustful desire, and pride. Their desires for holiness, righteousness, and a relationship with God would soon be extinct. They would love self and sin and nothing else. Left on their own, they would be utter slaves to Lucifer. They would have no power to resist him. God could have simply wiped them all away and started over. But God wanted another solution. He wanted to eradicate sin and Satan from the universe and to save us at the same time. God could not change his law in order to save humanity. He couldn't make something wrong suddenly be right or lawful. Since God was not willing that any should die from the sickness of sin, he cursed the serpent, prophesying of his demise, and he gave mankind a gift. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. This enmity, given in the Garden of Eden by God, would permit man to have power to resist the devil and give sufficient freedom to choose between the government of God or the government of Satan. The enmity gift would restore the image of God in mankind and take away their natural inclination for evil. There, in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were given hope. Now the gospel, that good news, that was preached to Adam and Eve right there in the Garden of Eden at the lowest time of their life. The plans that God had had for them of longevity and health and, and all this wonder that God had created for them, 
that had been lost, and yet God had a plan to, to restore that. And they heard that there in the Garden of Eden. This plan had been part of the discussion in the Council of God. Before this world was even made, God and Michael made a plan that would counter Lucifer's power and also vindicate God's character. He would save humanity at any cost, and yet remain the benevolent God he had always been. He would put an end to this war, once and for all, but the cost would be high, very high. 